And this is uh, Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, and the same Spirit and there are varieties of and there are varieties of services from the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. One is given through the Spirit an utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by one spirit, and to another the working miracles of another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, and another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A simple gift. Now, we are firmly in the season of Epiphany, a time of paying attention to the revelation of God in the ordinary. To draw on Pastor Don's theme from last week, this is a season of paying attention to the emerging kingdom of God in the ordinary stuff of life. The mustard seed, the yeast, the treasures we hide from ourselves, the things of value that we are seeking and then find, the nets of grace that catch us up and pull us in. Now, some of you asked last week, what were you doing, pastor, sitting in the congregation? A question which just resonated so deeply with me because I have to say one of the things I miss most about being average Joe person who sits in the pew is that I never get to sit in the pew and listen to great preaching. So I had just a blast worshiping with you all last Sunday. And I think that that's one of those ordinary pieces of life that we can take for granted when we get to do it every week. But take it away, such as have the opportunity not to sing for two Sundays, and suddenly you realize that without the words of immortal, invisible, God-only wise, that hymn only has half of its meaning. Today we are faced with two scriptures that, at first glance, do not seem to necessarily refer directly to the kingdom of God, that ordinary stuff of life which reveals who God is to us. And yet... If we understand Jesus' ministry as Jesus himself understood his ministry, as the work of revealing and participating in God's sovereignty, love, and grace, then there is no lesson we can take from the New Testament that does not deal with the kingdom of God. These two scriptures ask us each a very important question. With God at work in our own lives, and in the lives of those around us, what are those lives revealing about God? 1 Corinthians 12 opens with the typical enthusiastic correction of Paul. Now, how many, how many of you, when you read Paul, you're like, man, that guy just never has anything nice to say. <laughs> I have to say that I really wrestle with Paul for that reason. I just want him to be like, church, you're awesome. You can do this. And then I remind myself that he knows, just like all of us, what it's like to live in a community with people. And churches are awesome. They're filled with incredible people. But like any community, we all make mistakes and drive each other crazy, right? So Paul is making a little correction. He wants to make sure that we, the people sitting in the pews or the seats or the churches, that we are doing the Christian life correctly. And he is never afraid to tell us when we are wrong. He says, therefore, 
I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Paul opens by saying that the Spirit of God works in a very specific way in our lives. God will never work in our lives in a way that pushes us to dishonor Christ. If we disrespect the Spirit of God in our own lives or in the lives of others, then we are not paying attention to the Spirit at work within us. And how might we do that disrespecting? Well, I know for me, one of the things I wrestle with is bitterness. Any of you ever fall, fall victim to that one? <laughs> my, my favorite grumble buddy just raised their hand. Absolutely. I, man, you get me on a roll about things that drive me crazy. Mm, we're going to be on that train for days. Another thing that a lot of people don't know is one of the things I go after is seeking revenge. How am I going to get back at so-and-so for whatever has happened? Or maybe I'm just going to quietly withhold forgiveness. Just quietly. You'll never know. But I'll just hold on and hold on. And in this way, sometimes I end up despising grace. Or here's another thing I'm really good at, judgment. Now, I know none of you have ever judged anybody ever in your entire life, right? <laughs> Amen, brothers and sisters. <laughs> oh, I am so good at judging. And yet, if we are seeking out those specks in the eyes of our neighbors, we're not attending to the logs in our own eyes. And Jesus says, stop. Pay attention to the work of the Spirit within you. Because if you are doing these things, you are not paying attention to the work of the Spirit, not in yourself, not in others. Then Paul goes on from there to say there are a variety of gifts, like your spice drawer. How many of you only have salt and pepper in your spice drawer? I didn't think so. <laughs> right? We have lots of different spices in there. So there are a variety of different gifts exactly the same way. But all of those gifts come from the same place which is the, oh, you guys were listening. Praise Jesus. I didn't even have to cheat, right? Yes, the Holy Spirit. Now hold on to that, okay? Now, in addition to this variety of gifts that we all have, there are also a variety of services, different ways we can be engaged in the world in service of God and one another. But they all come from the same, and this is a Trinitarian expression, so don't say Holy Spirit. This one starts with an L and ends with a D. They all come from the same... Ooh, wow. I'm so impressed, I'm like literally speechless. <laughs> That's right, they all come from the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, different things that we can do, or different ways that we can be. But they all come from the same, and this one starts with G. Oh, they all come from the same God who activates all of them and everyone. Did you catch that? Right there, Paul is listing out that we have a variety of gifts from the same spirit, a variety of services from the same Lord, and a variety of activities from the same God who activates them in everyone. Trinitarian, right there, to each of us, is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Paul has this vision of life in Christ that is completely unique in the New Testament. Remember, Paul was not part of the original community of disciples called by Jesus during his earthly life. He never had firsthand contact with the man, Jesus. Instead, he meets the resurrected Christ in the midst of a mission to destroy the fledgling Christian movement. What is extraordinary about Paul is that his understanding of Jesus is completely different than what we find in the four Gospels. It's one of the reasons why reading the Gospels and the letters of Paul side by side are so challenging, because they're using different metaphors to pull us into the same thing. A testament is given to us in Paul's work to the importance of each and every one of us as individuals. 
We are important to the ongoing work of God. In Paul's own words, to each of us is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now I want you to take a moment to take that in. Close your eyes. You are holding the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your own life. That is what you have. That is what God has given you. And for what reason? So that you can participate in the common good. Paul's work is built around the understanding that God needs each of us, our unique ways of looking at the world, our unique life experiences, our particular gifts, and God uses each of us for the good of one another. Or another way of saying this is, without you, my friends, and I mean you, without you, the kingdom of God is incomplete. We as a community are incomplete. Our common good is not as good as it could be. To each of us is given a gift, and we do not all have the same gifts, thanks be to God. And indeed, depending on our own experiences, we might not even value the gift we've been given. As I was listening to Linda read this, I was recalling a time when I worked at a job and, and my boss had me take this uh, inventory to find out what my skills were. <laughs> I still laugh about it because my top skill listed on this inventory was thinking. <laughs> Which is, if you know me really well, maybe is not surprising, but it was pretty surprising to me. I was like, really? That's what I'm good at? Like, <laughs> what can you do with that skill? I can, I'm a doer, I wanna be able to do things, and you're telling me my gift is thinking? And I remember saying to the coach, you know, this is such a useless gift. <laughs> now, I don't know about y'all. I don't know if you have a gift in your tool bag that feels a little useless to the world. But the last thing God ever wants to hear us say about our own unique individual selves is that we're useless. And the coach came back at me and said, no. Do you know how important it is in a big organization like this to have somebody who's willing to slow things down and say, hold on, let's think about that for a minute. Let's look at it from different perspectives. And I was like, nobody ever wants me to say that in a meeting. And, <laughs> and yet that was my gift. Another thing that I have that I have often struggled with is that I'm an introvert. Do I have any introverts out there? Oh, praise be to God, right? And that means I recharge and find energy in quiet times alone. It does not mean I don't like people. I love people. But when I need to recharge, I want to be quiet by myself. Goes hand in hand with thinking, right? And I enjoy thinking, and I love daydreaming. And guess what? My favorite work is listening. <laughs> and for the longest time, I believed that I had nothing valuable to offer the church to enhance the common good, because I'm not a doer. I'm not very good at dreaming up big social events or, or getting little tiny ideas. I am certainly not a social butterfly. It is like pulling teeth for me to go to parties. I certainly did not like speaking or praying in front of others. In fact, I would much rather just be quiet out there than do what I do every Sunday morning. So my question was, God, how can someone like me be a pastor? And yet, the call to serve through sharing God's love and grace, the call to participate in God's kingdom with, with my entire being, didn't just go away because I couldn't see how I could be useful in ministry. In fact, I think that's why God kept driving at me, kept calling me, kept pulling me. And it is quite possible that each and every one of you has an experience that's similar around your own unique gifts. I discovered that listening was a critical gift for the common good in a church community. I discovered that thinking and daydreaming could actually be useful to other people. And that God didn't need me to be a social butterfly because are there any extroverts out there? Raise your hand, right? I don't need to be a social butterfly because there are extroverts in this world. Thank you, Jesus. God 
God needs us to be fully who we are, to use the gifts that we have because they are activated by the same spirit. And now, on the first day of the new year, I preached a sermon on Ephesians 3.20. And friends, if we are allowing our faith to lead us and let us lean into our gifts, then we are fulfilling those words that Paul says, Now to him who by the power at work in us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine to God, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. That is what using our gifts allows. God to be seen, God to be known, the glory of God to be felt. There is one simple gift that God asks of each of us, and that is to be who we are to the fullest of our ability. And some of us are really good at offering wisdom. Any of you good at offering wisdom? You're like, I am not admitting to that in church, Pastor. Thank you. And some of us are really good at learning and reasoning. Do I have any logical people out there? Amen, right? And some of us are really, really fantastic at faith. And some of us know how to bring a spirit of healing and reconciliation to any room we enter. And some of us can pull off what seem to others to be impossible. We are those kinds of miracle workers. And some of us have the gift of foresight. We know how things can work together to shape the future. Some of us can read a room and discern the spirit of that room without a second thought. And some of us can just go up and speak to anyone and others of us can listen to anything that is said. God is asking us to be who we are. That is the simple gift God needs from us. Which brings us to the story of the wedding at Cana. I bet some of you were out there thinking, she forgot that there was a second scripture today. <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Because he's like, Dude, I'm at a wedding. Don't bother me. I've got things to do. I'm networking. I'm having fun. And his mother comes to him and says, they are out of wine. And I can just imagine Jesus being like, and that's my problem, how? <laughs> and yet that's what it is, right? Suddenly we are in the moment where there is a unique need within the community. And guess what? It's our gift that God needs in that moment. You see, Jesus is indeed a sign to us of what it means to live fully into our gifts because he is so comfortable with himself as the son of God, so tuned in to his calling, to the divine within him, that there is no separation between Jesus the man and Jesus the incarnation of God's love. These two things are woven together. And despite the fact that he is not ready, that he feels his time has not come, when the need of the common good is placed before him, he uses his gifts. He is himself. And he transforms that entire experience of the wedding. Now, none of us is called to literally turn water into wine, though... If that is your spiritual gift, you need to talk to me afterwards, okay? <laughs> but like Jesus, each of us participate in various communities, right? Our family, our church, our neighborhoods, societies and organizations, the communities of our jobs. And like Jesus, there are plenty of times when we're like, that's not my problem. That's not, I'm not ready to do this thing. I am not in the mood to bring this gift, and yet we are called to bring it to the table. Perhaps we don't feel like our gifts would be needed, but imagine what would have happened in this story. Imagine if Jesus had denied God and the Holy Spirit this opportunity to be at work. No one at the wedding would have known any difference. But the chance for God to transform the experience of this wedding through Jesus, to show the disciples who it was they were dealing with, would have been denied. A chance for the world to see God at work in this subtle way would have been lost. And that, my friends, is what happens when we deny our own gifts, 
When we say, oh, I can't imagine anyone needing that, or when we say, I don't value that in myself, when we do not show up to our own lives, especially in moments of community need, we are letting God's work in us fall. It is the simplest gift God could ask for. So friends, our challenge this week is to pay attention to the gifts we have, to name and honor those gifts. And when someone comes asking for us to participate in the kingdom of God as ourselves, to show up because we, we are that good wine and God wants us to share. Amen. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care. Headed who knows where. On they go through private pain. Living there to
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And indeed, we have a very exciting conclusion to our service today, Christ Church. Drum roll, please. Oh, wait, no, we don't have drums. Don't do that. Um, I'm going to invite Ken, Elaine, and Ed to come on up to the front. Come on up, Ken. If I didn't call your name, don't come up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Friends, we have several people who are joining us in membership at Christ Church today, which is always a celebration. Can you start by giving just a huge cheer? <laughs> I'm going to invite these three people to say a few uh, words just to give you an introduction to who they are. So, Ken, here you go. If you can just tell us who you are. And if there's a word you want to say about yourself, you can do that too. But I will cut you off. So, <laughs> so keep it brief. Many of you know me because you've taken me home from here. I live in a, uh, uh, we call it a care facility where my daughter put me. Uh, my daughter, three years ago after my wife died in Minnesota, said, uh, Dad, you're old. <laughs> and, I have, and I have a place for you. So I came here. I already belonged to St. Paul's Methodist Church on Broadway. And when I moved here, I found out I was close to this one. So that's great. I was uh, raised Baptist and uh, baptized when I was a youngster. But after I went off to college, I hardly ever went to church. But uh, many years later, the mother of my three children was divorcing me. And I went to a church to a marriage seminar uh, to see if that would help. And a fellow named Joe Lynn came up to me during a coffee break. And Joe and I talked. He gave me scripture, much of it sent from St. Paul. And uh, he became eventually the best man at my wedding to Christina. I met Christina in Kazakhstan, where we were both teaching. Uh, she told me that uh, she had been in jail twice for pro-life activity. She thought she'd get rid of me, but I was looking for a woman with conviction. And Christina <laughs> had two convictions. <laughs> so we were married about 30 years. We taught uh, in former Soviet Union during the school year, and we're back in Minnesota on our six acre farmstead during the summers. I don't know what else to say other than when I was coming here, debating coming here, uh, friends and I decided that the best reason to come here was to have a Christian influence on my grandchildren. So if you could pray for that and if you have any ideas of what's worked for you, please let me know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Welcome, Ken. And then also Elaine and Edwin. We're happy to be in your congregation. Um, we are actually lifelong Methodists, except for a short stint. When we moved to Tucson from Prescott Valley, we moved, we, uh, moved to Oro Valley, and we're real close to the can I say it? The Presbyterian Church. <laughs> and I joke that the main difference that we noticed was that they say debts and debtors instead of trespasses in the Lord's Prayer. But they had, they, that's a wonderful group of people and pastor and little church. We enjoyed it, but we're happy to be back with Methodists again. Okay. I think that's it. Welcome. <laughs> I always like to joke with my Presbyterian friends that, well, clearly God has chosen you to become Methodist, so there's a little Presbyterian Methodist humor for you. 
don't worry, you are among friends. And we've got a lot of Presbyterians out here. <laughs> so, friends, we have a couple of words that we're going to share together as we celebrate the reception of Ken, Elaine, and Ed into our church. The church is the body of Christ at all times and in all places. We are called by God, powered by the Holy Spirit, as a place of good news, salvation, and love in action. Christ Church United Methodist is one member in our global body. Will you say this with me? Together we are stewards of God's vision, of a world where all engage in fellowship, discipleship, worship, partnership, and stewardship, proclaiming with our lives that Christ is alive and at work in this world with and through us. Membership in the body of Christ begins with baptism, which all three of you have experienced. This is God's promise to us that we are saved by grace and will never be separated from God's love. Choosing to become a member of a church is one response to the acts of God's grace. Membership in Christ Church United Methodist is open to any seeking to participate in God's work through Christ in the ministries and community of this church. Today we welcome Ken Gray, Elaine, and Edwin Jones. God is at work in each of you, and so I ask the three of you, will you participate in God's ongoing work through Christ United Methodist by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, your answer is, I will. I will. Beautiful. That was I will, everybody. Woo. Church, these new members need each of you. And so I ask, will you do all in your power to strengthen their faith, confirm their hope, and walk with them in love? If so, your answer is yes. yes. And then let's say this together. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's holy church and welcome you to this congregation. We renew with you our vows to participate together by our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Let your faith be confirmed and strengthened in our ministry together. Amen. Will you all give them a huge round of applause? And here you go. Welcome to Christ Church United Methodist. And here's your new tag. And Elaine, here you go. Welcome to Christ Church. And here you go. Welcome to Christ Church. All right, one more big round of applause as these folks go sit down. Thank you and welcome. Let us stand as we. <laughs>
And now, my dear friends, receive this benediction. Let us go forth in peace and the grace and love of Christ and God and the harmony of the Holy Spirit be with us all in all that we do. Amen. You may be seated for the postlude. Thank you.